Saqqara, the largest necropolis of ancient Egypt. Here we'll find the most magnificent private tombs of the Pyramid Age, who were their owners thousands of years ago. Let's get to know their history, their beliefs, secrets and passions. Today I'll show you the tombs from the time when the funerary art truly flourished. I take you to Saqqara, to the tombs of the 5th dynasty. More than 100 tombs from the 5th dynasty have been found in Saqqara. Today I'm taking you inside some of them, the unique ones, the best preserved. I'll show you rare footage of these places, footage you won't see anywhere else. Before we start a new adventure, please subscribe to my channel to help me continue my journey through ancient sites. Thanks. Let's go! Near the causeway of Unas, about 270 meters west of his pyramid, is our first tomb. It's not a mastaba, but a small rock-cut tomb. Eru Kaptah was most likely not a noble, but a member of the middle class, the butcher of the mill of the palace. His charming tomb shows that he must have earned quite a fortune in the service of the pharaoh. I want to show it to you because of these beautifully preserved polychrome statues of the deceased, quite rare in the tombs of that time. The colors are still vibrant despite the passage of four and a half thousand years. Although the tomb dates to the late 5th dynasty, these niches with statues carved directly into the rock give the tomb a somewhat traditional appearance, characteristic of the earlier 4th dynasty mastabas. Irukaptah probably lived during the reign of Jetkara Isesi, turn of the 25th and 24th centuries BC, the predecessor of Unas. Unas, building his pyramid complex nearby, and especially the monumental causeway, ruined the earlier tombs. Fortunately, Irukaptah rested at a safe distance of 10 meters from Una's causeway. The butcher wears a short wig and a large necklace, characteristic of the Old Kingdom. The details of his loincloths with their colorful buckles and decorative bead rows have been beautifully preserved. The stocky images of Irukapta measure 1.35 meters, so they could be life-size. The average height of Egyptians at that time was 160 centimeters for men and 140 to 150 centimeters for women. Among the titles of the deceased we find the libationer and butcher of the palace, the acquaintance of the king, the honored one before the great god, the wap priest of the king, Irukapta. So he was a Wap priest, one of many lower-ranking priests responsible for providing offerings and tending to the temple's cult objects. Priests like him were more physical workers in the sanctuaries than sages absorbed in prayer. The vast numbers of animals brought to the temple were ritually slaughtered by skilled butchers under the watchful eye of the Wap priests. Irukapta performed both functions and was therefore an expert in ritual slaughter. As a wap priest, he had to be clean. He bathed twice a day and shaved from head to toe every day. His clothing had to be spotlessly clean. He couldn't wear animal skins and he wasn't allowed to eat fish, pork or beans. As you can see, the decorations in the tomb aren't of the highest artistic level. 
These paintings, although they have their charm, are more like graffiti than the sublime, magnificent decoration of the mastabas of the nobles of that time, which we will soon see in the vizier's mastaba contemporary to Irukapta. The contrast is incredible. Anyhow, it's still a beautiful tomb created as best as Irukapta could afford. It's small, only 13 meters long by 2 meters wide. While the mastabas of Saqqara fell into ruin for thousands of years, as robbers to get inside usually dismantled their roofs, which caused reliefs and statues to fall victim to weathering, tombs carved in the cliff rock, such as this one, if the entrance to it wasn't discovered, could remain intact until our times. Observing this process, the Egyptians abandoned mastabas in favor of tombs carved in the rock in the following centuries. When the tomb of the butcher was discovered in 1940, it had already been looted, of course, but as many as five shafts were found in it, probably serving the family of Irukapta. I'm taking you now to the aforementioned mastaba of the vizier from the time of the butcher Irukapta. About a kilometer to the northwest is the lonely family cemetery of the most powerful courtiers of the pharaoh Jetkara Isesi. As we know, the times of the 5th dynasty were a gradual increase in the crisis of kingship. Until recently, the highest offices held exclusively by members of the royal family began to not only be held by courtiers from outside the family, but they became hereditary. Before us, mastabas belonging to as many as three generations of viziers, jati, the highest officials, a kind of prime ministers of pharaonic Egypt, and just like with prime ministers, only one person could hold the position of vizier at a given time. Jetkara had as many as five viziers during his long reign. Before I show you the magnificent decorations of tomb D64, let's take a look at the ruins of the mastaba of Ptahotep I, which for safety reasons is closed to tourists. The walls are in danger of collapsing and in one of the chambers there's a nest of bats, which I really don't like. Tahotep I is known today for his didactic instructions left to his son in a papyrus record, preserved in several copies. Tahotep states, quote, Injustice exists in abundance, but evil can never succeed in the long run. He also advises, A woman with a happy heart will bring you balance. Love your wife with passion. We are in the neighboring mastaba belonging to his son, Akatotep and grandson, Ptahotep II, who were also viziers. In front of us are beautifully preserved reliefs in the chapel of Ptahotep II, who was the first vizier of the last king of the 5th dynasty, Unas. In my opinion, these reliefs are among the most beautiful in Old Kingdom Egypt. The artistic level of decoration and the grandeur of the mastabas of the lords are evidence of the political changes in Egypt in the late 5th dynasty. In the past, all power, including economic power, was held by the pharaohs, which in times of prosperity was reflected in monumental architecture with the Great Pyramids of Giza. Now, however, in times of crisis, part of the wealth of the empire went to politicians such as Ptahotep, who became a patron for artists creating private art, 
artist who had previously been undervalued. Hence, we observe in these tombs a true flourishing of the fine arts, which lasted until the fall of the Old Kingdom, which would happen in the 23rd century BC. On the western wall of the chapel, a false door, topped with the latest fashion of the time, Kaveto Cornis, which symbolizes that Ptahhotep is a worshipper of Osiris, a new religion promoted by the palace. It's at this time that the king recognizes Osiris the savior as the god of the dead, who will replace the traditional Anubis in this role. We find evidence of this belief in the text of the Pyramid of Unas, which we've already explored, linked to the film in the description. A unique representation of the deceased carried on a litter with a canopy. The well-preserved ceiling of the chamber is decorated traditionally with imitation of wooden beams, which refers to early dynastic architecture. The second false door on the same wall has a more old-fashioned form, an ancient motif of the facade of the royal palace. No inscriptions, but beautifully painted patterns imitating the decorative reed mats with which ancient rulers covered the walls of their wooden, tent-like palaces. Tahotep probably had to be sure that one of these doors would work so that he could receive offerings of food and drink in the afterlife. As the vizier supervised the entire state, the themes of the reliefs are diverse. Among the carriers transporting products for the palace by river, the creator of the reliefs portrayed himself, beloved and trusted, the main sculptor Ankhemptach. This may be the oldest known signature of an Egyptian artist under his work. The scene of a family of craftsmen creating a reed boat is signed with the following dialogue. Boy, bring me the ropes. Oh, father, here's the rope for you. Wild waterfowl feeding in the wetlands were caught in large nets and then delivered in cages to the royal farms. As usual, the most interesting reliefs are in the highest registers. It's not easy to film them. Dangerous wild animals such as lions that attack cattle are consistently exterminated by the Egyptians, who have adapted even a larger, previously wild territories for farming. Using hunting dogs, they fight the chaos, represented by wild animals, and thus spread the divine order, mad. Such a policy would force them 
already in the times of the New Kingdom to import from distant Nubia lions exterminated in their country. In the center of the mastaba is an undecorated hall with four columns. From here one can get to the beautiful chapel of Ptahotep II as well as to the chapel of his father, Akhatotep. Unfortunately, the chapel of Akhatotep is in much worse condition. On the largely damaged false door, we can read one of the oldest texts referring to Osiris. May the king and Anubis grant an invocation offerings of bread and beer to him in the necropolis as daily rations every day. May Anubis, lord of the sacred land, grant his burial in the necropolis and a very happy old age as to one who is deserving. May Osiris, lord of Busiris, grant his burial in the necropolis city in the western desert. The white entrance corridor leading to the Mastaba chambers was also decorated by Akhetotep. However, it's clearly unfinished, even by his son. The outlines of the figures were made, but in many places they are left at that. The varying state of completion of the reliefs give us a rare insight into all the stages of their creation. Akhetotep in a short, thick wig, a white necklace and a starched triangular kilt, characteristic of Egyptian aristocrats of the Old Kingdom. The smaller figure walking in front of him is the future vizier, Ptahot of the Second, here shown naked with a youthful sidelock and holding a hoopoe by the wing. The hoopoe was considered at that time to be a symbol indicating that the child was the heir, the successor of the father. The death of the vizier stopped work on the decorations, but despite this, here and there, the details were completed. This is truly an extraordinary place, a fascinating mastaba. To visit the next third tomb from the 5th dynasty, we must return to the Unas pyramid complex. This is a beautiful place with perhaps the most mastabas. In fact, wherever you look, you see false doors emerging from the desert sands. We'll certainly return to the so-called Unas Cemetery. On the outskirts of his cemetery, about halfway up the causeway from the pyramid to the valley temple, is the famous Mastaba, the so-called Two Brothers, which Unas treated as a foundation. He led his causeway over the Mastaba, strangely enough without destroying it. So we know that it's older than Unas, probably built during the reign of King Nusereini in the 25th century BC. This is one of the largest and best preserved mastabas of Saqqara. At the same time, it arouses much controversy. It's not surprising that it belongs to two men, Nyank Knum and Knum Hotep, but what is surprising is that it consists of double chapels, not dedicated separately to each of the deceased, but equally dedicated to both of them. They both were prophets of Ra, high priests in the famous temple of the sun in Abu Ghurab, near the then royal necropolis in Abu Sir. Their position was therefore high, as they lived at the time of the apogee of the solar cult in Egypt.
They also performed secular functions as royal administrators, confidants of the king, his privy councillors, and perhaps their original function was supervisors of the manicurists of the palace. As we know, in the late Old Kingdom, the highest honors were often achieved by those courtiers who, due to the functions they performed, had direct physical contact with the ruler, such as hairdressers or manicurists. Due to their access to the divine pharaoh, inaccessible to ordinary mortals, their position at court was very high. In the first chamber we admire typical scenes of the mastabas of high officials. The deceased supervised the work of craftsmen, merchants, fishermen, hunters catching wild animals in the desert. Thanks to the preserved roof, the colors are in good condition. Although the mastaba wasn't discovered until 1964, humidity and acts of vandalism have left their mark on these reliefs. To get to the main chapel of the Mastaba, we pass through the unroofed open courtyard and enter the oldest part of the tomb, the rooms carved into the rock of the cliff. Originally it was supposed to be a rock cut tomb, like the one of the butcher, Irokaptach. However, the owners had to unexpectedly become rich enough to build themselves a magnificent mastaba whose new rooms lead to the antechamber and offering chambers carved into the rock. A beautifully decorated, monumental portal leads to these small, I'd say tight rooms. We're in the antechamber. This is where characteristic images of priests appear, suggesting their special, intimate relationship. They embrace, they even seem to kiss, which can be clearly seen on the pillar behind which is the offering chapel. Such intimacy is shown very rarely, usually kings were shown this way in the company of a patron god. Here, however, we have two men of equal status. The dispute over their kinship or relationship continues to this day. Are they brothers? As we know, some believe that they were twins. Are they a pair of lovers? We know for sure that they had their wives and children, also visible in these reliefs. But there's no mention of the kinship between Knumotep and Nyang Knum. Supporters of the theory of their alleged homosexuality point out that it was a phenomenon documented by the ancient Egyptians. A rendition of the story from the Old Kingdom, preserved in several copies from different periods entitled King Neferkare and General Sassanet, is supposed to prove the homosexuality of the king of the Sixth Dynasty, Pepi II Neferkare. His nightly meetings were witnessed by a certain Teti, a commoner, who saw. The divine person of the king Neferkare, going out during the night to walk on his own. Teti said to himself, If this is the case, then it is true what is said about him, that he goes forth during the night. Then Teti followed the king, who arrived at the house of the general Sassanet. He threw up a stone and stamped his foot, at which a ladder was lowered down for him. He climbed up and Teti, son of Hanet, waited. When his divine person had done what he wanted to with the general, he returned to the palace. The effort that the pharaoh was supposed to have put himself through 
indicates that such relationships weren't morally acceptable to the Egyptians, as also evidenced by the well-known mythological story of the seduction of Horus by Seth, which I mentioned in my podcast, links in the description, and according to some, by a fragment of the Book of the Dead, where renouncing such practices is an element of the so-called negative confession of the deceased on the judgment of Osiris. So what connected Khnumhotep and Nyanknum? We'll probably never know. It's another mystery of the Saqqara necropolis. Thank you for watching, if you enjoy our historical adventures and want to help me continue this, please join my Patreon community, link below the video. Please like, comment and share my video with your friends. I'd like to thank all the supporters of my channel, especially my dear patrons. Thanks to you I can create new content, this content. Also thanks to all of you who sent me super thanks here on YouTube. And if you're new here, I recommend you to watch my videos from other ancient sites, as well as my podcasts about ancient Egyptian beliefs and history. Last but not least, don't forget to subscribe to my channel to be up to date with new episodes. But first of all, I'd like to thank all my patrons. Without you, this all wouldn't be possible. You're simply beyond. Thank you again. See you on another ancient site.